In a world where most people watch movies and then forget about them, these brave heroes join forces to watch them again and then talk about them. Join them in their epic journey as they go back in time, a decade and beyond, to revisit and break down films from a vast array of genres. Do these movies hold up over time? Are they classics? Find out on Retro Movie Roundtable. Starring your hosts, Brian Fry, Chad Robinson, Devin McKenna, Nathan Lutz, and Russell Guest. Coming now to Headphones in Your Ears. Welcome all you lords, ladies and knights to the Retro Movie Roundtable. Welcome to the show where we watch movies and then talk about them. I am your host, and joining me today is my good friend and co-host, Devin McKenna. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing really good. I'm doing really good. But you know what? I'm, I am excited. Do you know why? Tell me. I'm excited because we have a first-time guest, and that gets me very excited. Woo! Let's go. Who is it? Today we have Latoya Walker from deep in the heart of Texas. Hi, everybody. So, Latoya, tell people a little bit about yourself. My name is Latoya Walker, and I am a motivational speaker. I am from the dallas Fort Worth area, and that's... I'm also a businesswoman, so... Do people ever ask you, do you employ the, uh, you're going to live in a van down by the river strategy? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. All right. That's good. All right. And uh, so some icebreakers here. Who is your favorite movie president? Because we are doing a presidential movie sort of today. So Latoya, who's your favorite movie president? I'm going to have to say the guy. I, I liked it. The guy also that played um, Roosevelt. Edward Herman. He was really good. He played that part really good. Awesome. And Devin, how about you? Who's your favorite movie president? I'm going to have to say Daniel Day-Lewis in Lincoln. I'm going to hold another direction with it. I'm going with Bill Pullman from Independence Day. Just, it's a... That's a great choice. Maybe not as Oscar worthy, but it it, it works for me. So, uh, last movie you saw, LaToya. It's actually the last of the Mohicans. That's an old movie. Yeah. Did you enjoy it? Yeah, 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 I did. I did. So you like long movies in general then if you're watching this movie and that movie then? <laughs> I I I was actually just it just came on, so I was just like, Okay, I ain't seen this movie in a while. Let's let's watch it again. It has a good meaning to it. Yeah, for sure. Well, we're talking a lot about Daniel Day Lewis here, aren't we? Devin, how about you? What is the last movie you saw? The last movie I saw was actually uh, Underground Six with uh, Ryan Reynolds. Uh, it's, a, it's a really great. I'm a huge car guy, uh, as you guys might know from the last episode. Um, I don't know if I mentioned that, but I'm a car guy. So the beginning, like 40 minutes of that movie, is just this in, insane racing scene with this Alfa Romeo Quadrifoglio through the streets of Europe somewhere, and it's just an awesome movie. Yeah, and is that the sixth movie in a series? Like, is that like? Fast and Furious Six, or is that just the name of the movie? No, that was a that was a a, a one off, um, just Ryan Reynolds movie. No background to it, as far as the numbers concerned. I mean, there's a deeper meaning to the six, but uh, as far as uh, in sequence of any other movies, there's no. It's it's a one off. The last movie that I saw was Wonder Woman eighty four. How was oh. that? You know what? Uh, I've seen a lot of very negative press, and I feel like it's starting to go too far the other direction. Is it this like amazing masterpiece? No, but I mean, it's a fun superhero movie at the same time. I mean, you weren't going in for an Oscar winner, I don't think. Wow. Yeah, it, it's, it's not as good as the first one. I think that that's led to a lot of backlash. I mean, is it perfect? No. I mean, but can you have fun with it? Yeah. So uh, I think people, people's reviews have been really, really down, and I'm probably just somewhere in the middle. So I'm going to, you know, yeah, that, that's where I'm standing on that one. I got you. It's on my list of things to see for sure. Yeah, I wouldn't steer you away from it. Just lower your expectations. So, um, <laughs> Let's get into this movie today. We are doing JFK. It stars Kevin Costner, Kevin Bacon, Tommy Lee Jones, Laurie Metcalf, Gary Oldman, Michael Rooker, J.O. Sanders, and Sissy Spacek. That is a loaded cast. Comes out in 91. It grosses $20 million. It places us on the 70th on the box office that year. Uh, 69 uh, ahead of it is Mobsters, and the movie coming in behind it was Three Men and a Little Lady. Uh, the number one movie from 91 was Terminator 2 Judgment Day. IMDb gives the movie JFK 8.0. 
Rotten Tomatoes critics give it 84%, and the audience likes it a little more at 88%. Now, this movie came away with some Oscars. It won Best Cinematography and Best Film Editing, and it was nominated for Best Picture, Director, Screenplay, previously based on previous produced material, Best Actor in a Supporting Role, Best Original Score, and Best Sound. Didn't win those, but that's a lot of nominees. It won the Golden Globes uh, Best Director, and it also got nominated for Best Motion Picture, Best Actor, and Best Screenplay at the Golden Globes, and it won two BAFTAs. So this movie got some big attention, and it was celebrated a lot. Now, LaToya, had you seen this movie before? Yes, I had. Yeah. What was it like the first time you saw it, and what was it like coming back to it today? It was actually interesting because I've been always a Kennedy fan, just the whole Kennedy family. So just actually seeing it on TV and kind of getting an idea of what happened to him and who played, well, who they speculated played a part because we don't actually know what happened. So yeah, that was, that was pretty, um, pretty neat because that's, that's, I wasn't even born when Kenny was alive, but I, I think I have had more infatuation with him than any other president. Yeah, he had a strong charisma to him, and obviously... He did. Yeah, and nobody has, uh, you know, I. it's awfully modern times to have a president assassinated, you know? I mean, Lincoln's so far in history, mm-hmm. you know, just there's so many things that are different about the world then, but there's something about Kennedy that's like... It's kind of modern still, right? It is. Just a whole Kennedy family, but it's like John was that. You know how, I, I don't know if you guys remember, like the Von Erics, like when there's a group of family, it, it's always going to be that one that, you know, that kind of stands out. And I think he was that one that kind of stood out. Yeah. Now, Devin, had you seen JFK before? I have, I have, yes. Uh, it was, it was actually one of my. I would, I wouldn't say my favorite movie, but I've definitely watched it a few times over the years. I think my first time seeing it uh, was probably like two thousand, two thousand one. Um, and at that point, it was just like I was very uh, juvenile to the whole idea of what really happened. <laughs> so, rewatching it, it was a, it was a big difference, definitely. Do you think that this has got good rewatch value and is it holding up over time? Oh, without a doubt. Uh, I personally, I feel it's it's definitely become more realistic for me. Like, I, I'm I'm a little bit of a closet case conspiracist, so this is like a, a huge segue and it goes like deep into the rabbit hole with all this stuff. So it scratches uh, an itch for you then. Oh, yeah, for sure. And then, uh, after you know, I've, I've been a fan of this movie for a long time and, and in with LaToya, I'm... I'm and agreeance we I would, Kennedy has always been a very fascinating uh you know story yeah so when I moved here to Dallas Fort Worth within the first two weeks that we moved here we went down to the book depository in Daly Plaza and I was able to walk Elm Street and and uh we went through the the book depository foot tour and walked all through it it's actually owned by uh Texas uh, historical preservation foundation or whatever it is now it's owned by the state of texas uh no longer privately owned and it was just an amazing thing to to actually walk that street and walk up the grassy knoll where you know all these speculations are made and and uh there's a lot of like foot um you know guys on foot that are down there the you know giving you like kind of guided tours and you know little hidden gems of uh what people don't know about you know the assassination that day and it's just a really crazy uh crazy feeling to be in that that area when uh, when you know the history of it right yeah yeah and latoya same question is it holding up for you it's just you know it's it's you know i'm i actually live in dallas so just when i pass by there like if i'm driving by i always just look over and think about it like this is actually where he was. This is the actual route. Like I remember I was going through that route one day and I was like, Oh my, this is actually the route. So it, it gives you that, you know, that kind of sadness feeling when you pass by, but then you see other people out there that's not from here and it. And they're actually like taking pictures and stuff. So that's, it's a good and a bad thing because it, it, you know, it was our president and he got, assassinated here so yeah 
Yeah. It's crazy when you drive down uh, Elm Street, mm-hmm. uh, they actually have the X's marked in the concrete uh, where the shots were fired and where he was hit. Right. Yeah. So I'm uh, up here in Pennsylvania. This I'm not so close to this one. And, and I'm not so close to this movie. This was my first time coming to the movie. So I'm going to be bringing a fresh perspective. I'm not uh, I'm not that steep in conspiracy traditions. So uh, I did find it interesting. And I have to say that this movie laid out something that, you know, you're sitting there. Uh, I kind of got lost in it. And then I did have a step back at the end and was like, oh, wait a minute. How much of this is real? And, um, you know. <laughs> Uh, it, it was it was presented in a very plausible manner. So I hope people did go back and at least uh, sit there and say this is something that could have happened, and didn't say oh this is definitely what happened. So right, um, <laughs> it's yeah. not a testimony. Yeah, <laughs> right. And also my um my fifth grade teacher, her husband was like one of the police officers that arrested him. So when we would finish our classwork, we would have to hear the story of that day. So that's. <laughs> Wow. Another thing I had just to throw in there. <laughs> I would love to hear his story. Yeah. yeah. Now, uh, we will be back and we will spoil this movie after these messages. What happens when two modern film fans go back and rewatch all the old classic films from yesteryear to see if they hold up? You get the Classic Film Jerks podcast. Find the Classic Film Jerks podcast on all the major platforms. Okay, we're back, and this is your final warning. There will be spoilers that lie ahead, so if you haven't seen the movie JFK from 1991, you're going to want to watch this movie and check it out. Otherwise, there will be spoilers that lie ahead. Now, Devin, do you want to refresh people who haven't seen JFK since 91? On November 22, 1963, President John F. Kennedy is assassinated in Dallas. Lee Harvey Oswald is arrested for the crime and subsequently shot by Jack Ruby, supposedly avenging the president's death. An investigation concludes that Lee Harvey Oswald and Jack Ruby acted alone in their respective crimes, but Louisiana District Attorney Jim Garrison is skeptical. Assembling a trusted group of people, he details the actions and takes it upon himself to investigate the assassination of President John F. Kennedy in Dallas. Garrison is extremely suspicious of the official story presented by the FBI, and what he already knows and what he subsequently learns leads him to suspect that there is more to the story than the public is being told. Yeah, so it ends up in a court case, but uh, unfortunately it doesn't uh, go his way, and the main person he arrested doesn't end up becoming convicted. So Yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. So Latoya, uh, Devin mentioned he likes conspiracies and, and that steeped kind of, maybe not alternative history, but just... Uh, unresolved history is a better way of putting it is this something that you enjoy as well yeah i kind of do like it because it gives you you can kind of brainstorm on your own like what you think actually happened you know without us like going into an argument with each other but you can kind of like conclude to yourself like what what happened but my opinion i i definitely you know it's something weird that was going on but I don't know. It could have been something that it could have really been these guys. This guy could have really probably acted alone. We just never know. But it it makes you think and wonder. Yeah, it does. I mean, uh, it's not an ordinary everyday thing that uh, someone takes down one of the world's most prominent leaders. So, mm-hmm. so uh, this movie generates an intense amount of controversy, and upon its release, with a lot of people accusing Oliver Stone of just making up facts. Uh, in fact, Stone published an annotated version of the screenplay where he justifies uh, all and attributes every claim made in the film. Obviously, the Garrison case is part of this, uh, so he's standing on that. But uh, n- we don't often see movies like this, do we, Devin? Uh, can you think of anything else that, like, normally things are more or less... We well, have a pretty good idea that the, this is what happened in the retelling. And it might be more theatrical. It might be jazzed up or condensed for entertainment purposes. But there's a lot of what, things we don't know here. No, I, I wholeheartedly agree. So uh, with this, uh, I do like to do my own personal research on this stuff. Uh, there, This movie is just an animal. There's so much going on inside this movie. You really can't find all the facts and what's fiction. So... The one thing that I did find uh, interesting about this is the where how Oliver Stone came across this story. Um, he actually received Garrison's book because Garrison had wrote a book. He received it in an elevator when he was in Cuba going to receive an award um, by Garrison's publisher. Wow. 
Yeah, he ended up he ended up hiring, uh, which it became one of the um, screenwriters or whatever. The, he ended up hiring Zachary Sklar, I believe, if I'm not butchering his name, who is actually the editor for that book to help him write the screenplay, which is crazy. So if you go if you go deep into facts versus fiction on uh, on this movie specifically. It is like a rabbit hole. <laughs> There's so many opinionated things, uh, articles, and and uh, it's it's really hard to nail down every every little detail. It is. This was a different kind of movie to research. Uh, some of our other true to events stories that we've covered, such as a Black Hawk Down or We Were Soldiers and things like that in the past. There's a lot of really recent accounts, and the movies are applauded for their accuracy or their efforts to get it right. This time, there was a lot of criticism. Roger Ebert took a, um, a lot of criticism from Walter Cronkite, saying the movie had, you know, wasn't a shred of truth to the film. The Washington Post wrote a scathing article uh, saying the movie was based on a first draft screenplay. Other newspapers followed suit uh, upon the film's release, you know, just saying that there were a ton of liberties taken by Oliver Stone on this one. Do you feel like this is one of those things where Stone was trying to change the narrative or is at very least is he trying to just say there are questions here and we don't know for sure uh, but this is plausible. Latoya like what do you think as the director Stone was going for in this? I think the movie I, I, I don't think he just sat there and just oh I'm gonna say this and I'm gonna say that I think his investigation on what the facts on what people told him what happened I think he kind of put that together but I, I don't think that he sat down and just said hey let me just write a screenplay on what I think happened I think these were actually interviews that took place and he just kind of summed it up together on what he had but we we we'll never know we will never know. Yeah. I, I you know one of the things that kind of struck me is odd uh, this movie comes out before uh, the George W. Bush presidency, but this movie mentions a conflict, an interest connection between the vice president having a military connection called uh, Brown and Root, and those financial motivations are, in theory in this movie, motivating the Vietnam War to escalate a war conflict in order to profiteer off of that, and Kennedy's assassination was something that stood in the way of that. It's it's quite a quiet acclaim, really, um, but it's one of those things where it's interesting how history may or may not repeat itself because I remember during the Bush presidency there were a lot of people drawing uh, parallels to Vice President uh, Dick Cheney, who had you know involvement with Halliburton, and he was a military contractor connected to him, and so it was one of those things where people were saying, "Are we going over to the Middle East and escalating conflicts over here for you know profiteering of you know weapons companies?" Mm-hmm. It's just interesting how all these things kind of cycle back around and there's untold stories and stuff and you don't know that that's why necessarily the middle east conflict escalated you don't know that this is why the kennedy assassination and the vietnam war happened but at the same time it does it's not it's not impossible when you hear it you know right i think that's where what you were talking about is that he really uh he kind of he leaves the breadcrumbs for you to kind of pick up and, and, and go with. It's, it's not that he's saying uh, everything in this movie is exactly how they shot it and how, you know, everything that he's saying in the movie is true, but it does pose those questions that kind of make you want to jump down the rabbit hole to look for yourself. Right. Yeah. I think that's, I think in a way, that's a good thing to draw attention to something because we didn't get concrete answers on that. I mean, maybe I'm... I, maybe I'm not as negative on it, but I, I, there was a lot of perhaps historians who had a lot of backlash against this. And, uh, you know, I can understand that to say you have no proof that this is what happened and, and you didn't you kind of presented it as such. But I'm able as a viewer to digest it and sit there and say, hmm, well, it, I can't say it didn't happen this way. And it, and it makes me pause and say, you know. I'm not going to speak with such certainty. It's kind of like if someone says, I think we're alone in this universe. It's like, well, I can't say for certain we are. Right. I don't, you know, we haven't found life on another planet, <laughs> but maybe, right. you know, and I, you know, so I'm, I'm listening and it's worth studying both of these things more to find out more. But uh, Latoya, do you feel, it's, I'm, I'm getting from you that you're not like upset that this is unsubstantiated stuff in here. And I also sense that you're not like buying into it and saying like, oh yeah, this is what happened. No, I'm not. I'm not buying into it because we don't know. So I can't, we can't buy into something if we don't 
no. Like, it has to be proven facts. Now, the story sounds like it, yeah, it probably could have went like that, but we don't know. So I wouldn't put up a debate and say, yeah, this is what happened, because I was born in 1980, and this assassination took place in, what, 63? 60, 63 is when he was assassinated. It was uh, November 22nd, 1963. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I definitely, I wouldn't put up a fight with it to say that it's what happened. It could have happened and the movie's really good, but we don't know that really happened. Now we had this a lot. With, so we, we do, we covered the movie Braveheart, uh, one of our most popular episodes to, to download. Also a long movie. Uh, but also riddled with factual uh, inaccuracies in that one. In fact, that one's more blatantly wrong. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, the three of us who were on that podcast on that day kind of just shrugged our shoulders and said, you know what? It's not historically accurate in the least, but you know what? It's entertaining. Uh, right. I kind of want to ask you, do you feel like this movie, while questionable with its factual values, is it interesting? Does it hold your attention for three hours plus? Oh, most definitely. It does. It does. So it could it could be... He could have made the movie to hold our attention and he also could have just used what, you know, what he had and created it based off what he had. So, but either way, it, it, it holds your attention and makes you wonder. Did you think the family life part of this movie, which was very much secondary, did you like that part of it or... This is a very long movie. Did you think this was room to be edited down or did you like those moments where they were like in terms of the balance between the court case's primary and Jim Garrison's suffering home life uh, is secondary? What was your take on that balance? As far as like, do you think I that um, they should have added like the family in the movie more or? Yeah. Do you want more of the family dynamics or do you want yeah, less? Yeah, I think, I think so. I think so because he was a, you know, he was a family man. So they should have showed that part also instead of just the bad, the bad, the bad. So it should have been more of his life that was shown in the movie. I actually read an article. I'm sorry that, he well, I, I was watching a documentary with and it was actually the CIA, and it was so funny because Kennedy had told them, "Do not let Jackie Kennedy go near Mister Onassis when she traveled over to, um, I think he was from Russia. Hmm. He told the CIA, "Don't let her go near him." And then years later, she marries him. So I was like, <laughs> "How much of?" Hmm. This is where the <laughs> rabbit hole opens. Where do we go from here? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, okay, so how much do you want people to stay away from each other? That was, yeah. Well, Devin, we have a, a an amazing cast here with a, a, an astounding amount of uh, possible recastings to go through as we go through this. But I mean, this includes seven Oscar winners, uh, Kevin Costner, Sissy Spacek, Tommy Lee Jones, Jack Lemmon, Walter Matthau, Gary Oldman, Joe Pesci, I mean, can can you think of many movies that are so... Oh, and two Oscar nominees, too, with Sally Kirkland and Laurie Metcalf. Uh, you know, how is this as an ensemble? I mean, they're throwing everything in the kitchen sink at you in the acting department. I mean, I think this is a, a lot to do with who directed the movie. The, the, the credibility of Oliver Stone uh, to get that amount of, of A-listers, B-listers, uh, I'm not shocked, I'll say that. Uh, you know, again, watching this movie later on in life, it's like, wow, he was in this too? Wow, he was in this too? Could I compare this to another movie? No, I don't think so. <laughs> I really don't uh, with the amount of, amount of A-listers and, and just... I, I think the casting uh, w- was phenomenal. I really do. I think that they, uh, I do have my, uh, my comments I'll make later when we get to that, uh, that part of the podcast, but I think they did a fantastic job with it. Now, reportedly, and the internet, the internet never lies about anything. Uh, Oliver Stone's first two choices to play Jim Garrison were Harrison Ford and Mel Gibson. And apparently after starring in Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, Costner wanted a year off of film and Stone then brazenly sent Costner's wife a copy of the screenplay and she persuaded him to, you know, continue acting and not take the year off and to go in and do this. So Oliver Stone cast Kevin Costner in the lead role based on his performance in The Untouchables, uh, which that's to me my favorite Costner role. 
And he wanted him to just be obsessed with solving the Kennedy assassination, much in the way he was with the Al Capone case in that one. But uh, connecting these two movies together, Costner got both roles in JFK and The Untouchables after the two primary choices of Mel Gibson and Harrison Ford turned both of those roles down. So uh, where Ford and Gibson turned down became, you could say these are two of Costner's signature roles. Latoya, would you want to see... Harrison Ford or Mel Gibson in this role, or did you like Costner? I think that it was played by Costner good. I, I don't, I, I can't imagine Mel Gibson or Harrison Ford playing that role. So I think that it was probably good that they turned it down because we, you know, you always get the right guy at the right time. So I could see Harrison Ford more than Mel Gibson, but I also see at this point in his career why he moved away from that. He was still. Mr. Action uh, star with Air Ford was. So right. I think it turned out well for all of them, to be honest with you. I just I can't see Mel Gibson in this, though. No, I, I agree with that wholeheartedly. Uh, yeah, Costner, he accepted the role, actually, uh, for $7 million, uh, plus a percentage at the box office. So. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, Ford, uh, Ford was taking his break. And actually, Gibson and uh, Oliver Stone, they apparently shared a strained, and I quote, strained dinner. Uh, over this uh, this role, and which eventually Gibson did not take it. Mm, interesting. Wonder what that was about. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. No. Rabbit hole. We're going down the rabbit hole. <laughs> so a bunch of other names, and again, the internet never is off with this anyway. So it's just fun to speculate. But uh, the others linked to this role of Jim Garrison include Alec Baldwin, Tom Berger, uh, Willem Dafoe, Robert De Niro, Michael Douglas, Gene Hackman, Michael Keaton, John Malkovich, Jack Nicholson, Dennis Quaid, Robert Redford, Robin Williams, and Don Johnson. Again, are you sticking with, uh, again, these are some heavy, heavy names. LaToya, you're happy where you are with Kevin Costner, even amongst all of these other quote-unquote considerations. Yeah, I can't imagine it without him. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, let's, yeah, then that's high praise. So, Devin, any other casting comments that you found? Well, not until you said William Defoe. Uh, I think William Defoe would have been a pretty good uh, Garrison. Honestly, okay. I mean, I think he's a fantastic actor. Uh, definitely picks his parts wisely, and uh, I think William Defoe would have been a really good spot for this as well. Uh, not saying Kevin Costner did not do a fantastic job, but I do think that uh, William Defoe would have been equally uh, as good. Uh, certainly would have been scarier. That's for sure. He's a scary man. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and now uh, Kevin Costner and Devin and Sutherland gave their monologues, like they're super long in the movie, both of them, and they both did it by memory, which uh, was pretty awesome. And uh, I kind of found it funny that Costner said he rehearsed his long speeches in the swimming pool with his mother correcting him, uh, right, watching the script and correcting him. So doing the super intense scene like in a swimming pool, like with your mom <laughs> correcting you, it's just it, it's a very funny mental image. Absolutely. Like, uh, it, it, it reeks of like, you know, uh, elementary school talent show kind of thing. It's like, no, you didn't do it right. Do it again, Kevin. <laughs> Can't go no better, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, you know, hey, mom, mom brings out the best in you. She's, she's a tough critic. So actually, so I have a, I have a couple, I wrote down, uh, some really good little tidbits of, uh, of backstory with this, uh, Kevin Costner, uh, was actually met, uh, Garrison's real enemies, uh, which was set up by Oliver Stone. Um, mm. the actor met both Garrison's fans and his critics. Uh, they were tough people and they'd come, they come in a parade, uh, in front of Costner with their New Orleans accent saying that Jim's a snake and, there was some speculation that he was actually uh, he was a homosexual and he liked uh, he liked men and he was actually angry that Shaw stole one of his lovers, uh, which was another reason why Garrison went after uh, Mr. Shaw or Tommy Lee Jones in the movie. Mm. Yeah. You know, one surprise casting I had was John Candy popping up in this movie. This didn't seem like a movie for him, but apparently. Oliver Stone thought he portrayed Dean Andrews uh, with the striking resemblance of the man. So uh, uh, Wayne Knight and, and uh, John Candy, uh, some strange fits. But you know what? It kind of works. Definitely agree with that. Uh, and I will talk more about that later. <laughs> All right. So Latoya, now Oliver Stone as a director here in JFK, what do you think of him as a director here on this effort? I think he's a really good director. I think this effort was really good. So... Do you like the, so I want to say like, this is a long movie, 
but it didn't feel quite as long as what we were getting in no. for. Like it moves pretty quickly, wouldn't you say? Yeah, it's like one of those long movies that you you don't get bored with it. Like you you're actually sitting there and glued to it and waiting for the next thing to happen um, because each piece of it is is good. So it's not like one of those long movies where you fall asleep and you wake up and watch the other half another day. So <laughs> it wasn't like uh, Daniel Day Lewis and Lincoln, uh, where you <laughs> the movie oh, yeah. was great, but it was a uh, <laughs> you try to follow it, but it's just too slow. Right. Yeah, Stone said that filming the murder of Kennedy was probably the hardest two weeks of his life. Much like uh, you were mentioning, uh, Latoya, that it just—it's a powerful thing to put yourself in and to recreate that in a movie is uh, is a challenge for him. And uh, he said uh, it took four days, and uh, it, it, but it maintained the power of the moment for him, and it was a powerful experience. So, uh, just imagine covering a historical event like this. I, you know, I read we did we we covered Jurassic Park earlier uh, last year, and. Uh, we Spielberg was shooting Schindler's List at the same time, so just much less doing two jobs at once like that, but just living your life, being a regular person, but also kind of being responsible for bringing the vision, setting up this reoccurrence of this tragic event. Right. I just right. that's that's a lot to deal with as as a, as an artist, as a director. Yeah, yeah. You most definitely have to deal with the critics with this. Aside aside from the actual, I mean, the dynamics of of creating a movie uh that was based in the 60s in uh in the 90s in a and uh, the locations that they were shot in were were new orleans which is obviously new orleans but uh they used a lot of the original uh locations in dallas uh for the shooting which was a crazy thing uh back then so a lot of people were shocked that they they got these shots that they did because the how like you know profound they were with he got entrance to the book depository to make the actual shots they were inside the actual book depository on some of these shots yeah Um, Mm -hmm. they spent seventy thousand dollars uh to recreate the inside of kennedy's oval office uh during his presidency uh and it was reconstructed from uh, archived footage uh and it was only in the movie for eight seconds in uh, in black wow yeah oh uh, money well spent i'm sure Oh, yeah, it gets even better. So Oliver Stone spent $4 million to restore Daly Plaza to its 1963 form. Wow. Uh, and during the filming, uh, Dallas police had to reroute traffic for three weeks. Now, knowing downtown Dallas, could you imagine the pandemonium trying to reroute traffic in downtown Dallas for three weeks uh, that's what I was going to ask. Is this a main artery? Because I've never been to Dallas. So, like, that was one of, me, one of my questions. Logistically, is this a hard place to film and to control? Oh, yeah. 100%. Is it? Yeah. Yeah. And another question I have along those lines are, being that you're there and you know the location, are they changing a lot of things to get it to look in that state? Like, have there been new buildings constructed that they had to work around or and to shoot around? Like, like, do they have a building that's like a glass high rise or something like that that's invisible that they had to, like, work around? Or is this area very much still of the period, do you think? Uh, oh, uh, I, in the 90s, I'm not sure, to be completely honest. With you. Obviously, I, they were filming in 1990, but... Uh, from what it looks like today, it's, it's really, I mean, today it would be all CGI'd, uh, to be completely honest, but, <laughs> um, back in the nineties, it wasn't as easy. Uh, but I would, I would say, no, there wasn't much of a, a massive mm-hmm. change. Interesting. Yeah. If you, if you like ride by there, you can, you can actually like tell that's this where it was. Like, right. You know exactly where you are. Yeah. You know exactly where you are. Okay. Yeah. I, I was wondering how much of uh effort it was to get the place to feel like like it would have in 1963 and so what i'm hearing from you guys is uh we're still not so far away from it that it doesn't feel like that anymore yeah no the texas uh, theater historical society they have uh a lot of hold over these locations um another little tidbit of information but the exterior of the texas theater where oswald was actually arrested Mm -hmm was remodeled uh, for the filming to look like it did back in 1963. Mm. Uh, Texas Theater Historical Society has a massive stronghold over these entities, uh, and 
and I don't think the state of Texas will allow much, uh, you know, renovation uh, to, to change the aspect, you know, the visuals of how the place is. That's what I was wondering. Like, is there an Arby's sitting on the grassy knoll today? <laughs> Absolutely not. Okay. It's still a wooden fence. <laughs> OK. Yeah, it's one of those things where I, I, I remember going to Gettysburg at one point and they had a beautiful modernist 1950s visitor center there that they made a tragic mistake to tear down. It was, a, it was an architectural wonder. And they said it destroyed the character of the battlefield. But visible from where that building stood, the extent of the monument and parks uh, boundaries were there. And across the street from that were like Howard Johnson motels and like, again, Arby's and McDonald's. I'm sitting there going like, and this building, which was thoughtfully placed and stuff like that, is ruining your experience? So... Um, <laughs> But anyway, it's nice to know that the, the grassy knoll is still a grassy knoll. Oh, definitely, without a doubt. Going back to the director a little bit, Stone seems to be... Uh, so I, I noticed he did, he's, this is his third presidential movie. He's done Nixon, JFK, and W. Now, have you guys seen that? And can you compare the way that those movies were presented to this one at all? LaToya? I haven't seen W. Okay. Uh, w was interesting, though. Because it was like mid-presidency. It was just done in 2008. So it was a very strange time to take on that effort, I thought. The story was still happening. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'll have to look at that. I was going to say, this is another movie I have to add to my to-do list. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, w, I can just say, was one of those things of just like, if you watch The Social Network, it's a really good movie. But then you're kind of like, what happens next? And then it hasn't happened yet. And there's something somewhat unfulfilling about that. But W also makes a number of, mm, you could you could call them insensitive, depending on what your political views are and stuff like that, or you can say presumptuous views of the of the presidency, what motivations and what the man was like. So, I can't say it was attempting to be mm, not necessarily objective or to let history go through. It definitely has a stance on there, much like this movie does, of saying like hey, there's a conspiracy and I want you to take a look at this. W is done in that same editorial kind of fashion where it's just like, I have some critiques about what this presidency is doing. And, you know, there's a political message to do that in the time when he was there. But when handling the movie of a presidency like that, I think it's really hard to do in the time. So I don't know. But had you had you seen Nixon? No, I actually haven't saw Nixon either. Okay. So I'll have to look at, watch both of those. That's just an interesting point of comparison. Had you seen any of other Stone's other movies? He's he's a celebrated director. Platoon, The Doors, yeah, JFK, uh, yeah. Alexander, which uh, I, I call this one out to be like, this is his down point. I, I always, I'm always hard on the movie Alexander. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Wall Street is another one of his. Um, so I just was looking to see, like, do you see... Um, stone isms and in, in the work and some parallels between his other work and this one i don't think it's the actual how the films are filmed or how they're directed i think it's the films themselves or what is so stone <laughs> um <laughs> you're talking he he also directed world trade center yes uh in 2006 which mm-hmm. uh ex- at the time uh was extremely controversial because the world trade center had just fallen five years prior Uh, A lot of people, you know, being from New York in that time, um, a lot of people were like, how could they do this? Uh, You know, they waited 40 years to write a movie about Pearl Harbor. Why would they why would they wait only five to make a movie about the World Trade Center? They're, you know, they're working off people's, uh, you know, off their tragedy and they're trying to benefit Mm -hmm. off of it. And um, uh, is Snowden. Mm-hmm. Uh, the movie about Edward Snowden, that's another one, which is, again, unfinished. We have yet to see how this plays out. Yeah, there's definitely, a, like, the, from the mid-2000s on, he, he he's very much mm, going after more current political themes. Right. You got those emotions are still fresh. Yeah. He has a trend, for sure. And, uh, you know, he, he's, he's very edgy. <laughs> we'll say edgy. I think is the best word to describe his directing style and his choice of... Uh, of films. Platoon's 86, The Doors is 91, which is takes place, you know, in the 60s, and then uh, JFK here is in 91, and so it's kind of interesting. And Nixon's 95. He actually is very much in this mid-century to late mid-century kind of era, you know, 60s kind of stuff in his filmmaking, all the way up to the 90s, and to your point, Devin, I think it's interesting how he kind of flips a switch, 
like he makes the movie Alexander, which is a super antiquity historic movie. And I think I, I think the general consensus is that movie sucked. And <laughs> you um, are pretty hard on that movie. <laughs> it, 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 it's uh, it's a it's three hours not well spent. I'll say that. Um, but then like he does, like you said, the next thing he does is World Trade Center and he completely changes the direction of his career after that. And so he goes on the newer side. So it's interesting. I wonder if he's like one of these like beings who like uh, lives for like a long time. Like he cryogenically froze himself or something like that in the 60s. And then he woke up in the new time and nothing happened in between. Hmm. I agree wholeheartedly. Just, just kidding. Latoya, did you feel like things were presented in an understandable manner. Like I felt like the beginning, I was having a little bit of a hard time. Like, wait, who's this guy? Wait, who's this guy? But at some point it settled in for me. Like, did you feel oriented as you went through this movie? I didn't know any of who, like, that's why I said that he really had to do like a thorough investigation because the people that he had in that movie, we had no knowledge about the deal with, him going to Cuba and New Orleans and all that other stuff that was in the movie. Um, I'm thinking maybe if it was something that he just made up, he wouldn't have had that much of details. They're all that they're all details. So I think that, yeah, I didn't know any of those people until he actually made the movie. I think it it came with a lot of back research too. Uh, Yeah. As an example, you know, um, John Candy, like, you know, all the big names, you know, Oswald, you know, Kennedy, but, uh, yeah. you know, a lot of those uh, small time, you know, congressional guys and no one knows those people. Just, you know, if you mm-hmm. heard them in the news, you'd be like, who? But, you know, you really <laughs> got to do your research on uh, on who these people are and how they played their roles in this whole, you know, in the whole scene or in the whole, you know, investigation. Yeah, I, I didn't even know of the. The Castro deal with whatever Kennedy and Castro. Oh, C- C- yeah, the Cuban Missile Crisis. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I I didn't know that until I looked at the movie. Yeah, it was a tense time. Yeah, we almost got blown off the face of the earth. <laughs> in terms of the style, did you like the way the movie felt, Latoya? Like, in terms of they're presenting an old movie and some of the things that they're doing to present this, there's like a retro wash, like the color spectrum of the film throughout this desaturates the greens and reds. So it's really strong in like the yellows and the warm tones. And it kind of looks like old photographs of the era look. Mm-hmm. Um, did you, and also there's a lot of snapshots of historical imagery. Uh, right. pictures of other things, fast cuts of information while people are talking. And um, these are some stylistic moves to either immerse you in the yeah. area or also keep you up with the speed at which Garrison's assimilating all this information. Did you like the way that that felt in terms of putting you into the feel of the movie? Yeah, I think that was pretty cool. Yeah. I want to say that that's one of the things that made the movie feel feel like it was moving fast there's so many dialogues and stuff like that if he just sat there and kept the camera on somebody's face yeah this could have slowed down like (laughs) we're not going to show you donald sutherland talking for 16 minutes straight so um he did a good job to keep you immersed through heavy amounts of dialogue i would say that right i I can tell you a quick backstory uh on on some of the actors and our, our one specific actor and how they felt about Oliver Stone and his shooting. Yeah. Tell, tell uh, I got, I got a quote here uh, from Joe Pesci and I quote, uh, I will never work with Oliver Stone again. Wow. He's phoned. He's asked. Oliver is a brilliant director, but he's a horrible person. He beats up emotionally on his actors and crew and has no respect for anyone but himself. Wow. Strong words. Oh, wow. Very, very strong. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I didn't shooting, know that. Shooting JFK was tough. Oliver Stone is too demanding. Uh, the fun is out of it. Uh, you know, he said, you know, you can't collaborate with someone who's trying to dominate all the time. He should, he should put a puppet show. He should put on puppet shows because it's not all <laughs> one man. Oh, man. <laughs> Scathing. Wow. Oh, wow. Yeah. He, he really let him have that. it. Well, Joe, yeah, that's bad. Joe changes the direction of his career after this. He goes and does uh, Home Alone with Chris Columbus, uh, you know, directing that one. So uh, shortly thereafter this. So, uh, you know, uh, maybe after being stressed out on this one, he needed a lighter affair. 
I think the stress in that movie that Joe Pesci was trying to portray was real. <laughs> After reading those comments, it feels like he was actually upset uh, the way he was acting, smoking all those cigarettes and talking a thousand miles an hour. I think that was really him in the moment. Oh, yeah. He had big personality, big wig, and big eyebrows to go with it all. Oh, my God. <laughs> my first thought was like, that's a terrible looking wig. And then later on, everybody else knows that it's a terrible looking wig. It was like, oh, it was okay, okay, every, okay, everybody knows <laughs> it at least because my my wig dar was going off pretty hard at that point. It's like that is a toupee, and I'm very aware of it. But that's what they were going for. So, oh, for sure, uh, Oliver Stone actually wanted Marlon Brando uh, to play X in the movie. Uh, it just didn't work out. Hmm. Yeah, they're apparently Oliver Stone offered the role of. Uh, Oswald, uh, Lee Harvey Oswald, to Frank Whaley, uh, who was apparently told by Stone, and he quoted uh, while he was working on The Doors, um, that he was going to be selected to play Oswald. <clears throat> Mr. Whaley found out that uh, Gary Oldman was selected to play Oswald while he was reading a magazine that was handed out for free uh, from a movie theater. <laughs> so he, re- he got the bad news from some, uh, you know, Penny... Or uh, some free flyer that the one of the theaters he was in uh, wow. handed out showing <laughs> that uh, Gary Oldman was selected for Oswald. So he was pretty heartbroken. Hmm. Oldman's such a chameleon. Uh, this this one, uh, he's he's certainly creepy. And I think he gets the right amount of creepiness for this one. And mystery, too. There's, there's some <laughs> mystery to this character. For sure. Absolutely. But we were talking about rapid transitions and historical footage put into here. There are over 2,800 shots included in this. So... If you think about fast cuts, there are 2,800 shots in this film. Wow. Which is a staggering amount. Now, granted, it's a very long movie, but still, that's a lot of shots. That's insane. It is. That's, that's almost as wow as uh, Nightmare Before Christmas uh, <laughs> amount of time spent. <laughs> Not quite a week to create, like, one minute of movie. Or, yeah. <laughs> yeah that's insane. insane. Yeah, but you're right. Uh, that, that is still impressive. There was one stylistic thing that I thought was just strangely inconsistent with things. Do you remember like the scene like when Jack Lemmon gets hit in the beginning, like and they're in the office? And I, honestly, this part of the story I borderline might edit out because it seems that it's not integrated enough and it's not focused around Garrison's investigation yet. But it goes into this weird low camera angle and it's like a slow motion perspective as he gets hit and i just thought like huh that was a weird choice it kind of stuck out to me at the time and then stone never goes back to that again there's a lot more i would say consistency throughout the movie and i thought that was a weird like thing that uh just nothing was like that in the whole rest of the movie even the fast cuts of like you know the characters moving fast during the in theory supposed assassination uh attempts and stuff like that and i kept looking for that and on my second time through the movie i was just kidding sitting there like yeah they, that was a weird stylistic move that's tonally different from the rest of the movie and i don't know why that stuck out to me so much but it, it did do you mean like the the aggression was that what you was that what you're talking about like when when you're talking about when guy banister when he when he pistol whips yeah um, yeah yeah, yeah that, that that scene in general feels different than the rest of the movie almost like it shouldn't have been uh, at that moment maybe maybe it was a little too early to be that tense maybe yeah, and, and, right. also, and also like hey like i said i think you could edit this out it's a long movie um and it's not involved around garrison's not this isn't garrison centric but the other thing is the way it's the lighting is darker it's shot lower it's not as yellow as a lot of the rest of the movie is and then there's this really really blurry slow motion and nobody in it's like, you know, I mean, I guess they've had some drinks and stuff like that, but I, I don't think, you know, it, it's done in just such a way that just kind of stuck out to me. I don't want to stay on it too long, but it just was one of those things where it's just like, huh, you did something different there. It almost feels like it's not a director in that scene. And like I said, I might just edit the whole scene out. Agreed. It doesn't really, it doesn't really segue into much. Yeah, we don't see either of these characters later in the movie i guess lemon's character begins the garrison investigation and you could still have the scene at the racetrack with him but you really don't need to see jack lemon prior to that right that's uh that's it for the segment we call russell being nitpicky i guess (laughs) (laughs) it was a good one that was good but uh we talked about stone getting permission to use a lot of the sites which was pretty difficult in in dallas and and also new orleans too I, i one of the things i liked about new orleans was 
Uh, New Orleans so steep in history and stuff like that. Uh, it was easy to get a lot of those historic scenes in there. We talked about Dallas, but did you guys like the New Orleans part of this movie, Latoya? Yeah, I did. I actually did. I was I was actually shocked too to see that do. Orleans played a role in this that it went so deep into you know you see, it's one thing to see Cuba then when I saw New Orleans I was like wait a minute now but yeah I, I liked it that before they you find out who Garrison is and where he's from you're kind of like why New Orleans like what does New Orleans have to do any has anything to do with the president D, you know DC and Dallas and I'm like it, it, the first time around I'm like what what is this and then you know you do your research and Garrison is a is a district attorney in, in uh, New Orleans. So um, Now, they also chose to portray the Kennedy assassination through Garrison's eyes more so in, in New Orleans. I think this is a, actually um, a heavy moment of the movie that uh, we, it's, it's an ambitious movie that this could get glossed over, but did you guys think that that moment, because I mean, if you know anybody who was alive at the time, they always say, I know exactly where I was when Kennedy was shot. Did you feel like they carried the weight of that moment in New Orleans? Oh, yeah, for sure. Absolutely. I think the whole country was involved. Uh, you know, it, it, same thing with, with 9-11, if you think about it in that aspect. Mm-hmm. It's like right. everybody knows exactly what they exactly were doing, where they were. Where they mm-hmm. were. Yeah, it, it was, a, mm-hmm. it was a, 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 you know, it was like an early 9-11, if you will. Yeah. That was the first time since Abraham Lincoln. Uh, I mean, obviously there were attempts on other presidents, but uh, in this manner, there was no president that has been assassinated uh, since Lincoln. And it was a, it was a timestamp for sure. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, might, I mean, Reagan had an assassination attempt, and Obama did as well, so. Um, I didn't know Obama did. Mm, yeah, I, it failed, uh, but yes. Thank God. I'm, yeah. yeah, I remember yeah. Reagan did. Reagan was a badass, I'm sorry I'm saying he the was. A-word, but he was a badass yeah, across I, the board. He sure <laughs> was, wasn't he? <laughs> what was his nickname, Raha? The yeah. Nickname? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah that, I saw a was, video um, after he yeah. had, the assassination attempt mm-hmm. he was making a speech and a balloon had popped and he's like oh you missed <laughs> <laughs> he was he was uh he was awesome yeah he was the hardest part of the process they said in the making of this movie particularly in terms of locations was the process of getting permission to transform the book to depository back to the way it looked in 63 so you talked about daily plaza being converted back but they also got a floor of the book depository building and uh, kind of made it look like it would have made looked in the in 1963 so that stripped down to the wood structure and all full of these boxes and stuff like that wasn't the way it was it was a finished out floor and they basically unfinished it at great expense and they had to go a floor down because there's a museum on the actual floor of the depository uh, right. where where they filmed that did you say have either of you been there by chance I, yes, I, I was going to say, uh, so the entire book depository from ground level to the seventh floor, I think there's seven floors or six floors, uh, is now all a museum. Uh, you walk in and you actually put on headphones uh, and they give you these, uh, their iPhones inside these little cases. And what you do is uh, you put the headphones on and the little cases are the audio tour and you walk through. Uh, and you basically follow each individual stopping point. And as you're, as you stop, you know, it tells you go to this next, you know, whatever. And you go over and it explains everything that happened Oh, that, you know, it's on the wall and they actually have the original suit from one of the, I think he was a secret service guy or something that, that, that had been transporting Oswald. Is it the guy who got shot through the shoulder in front of him? No, 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 no. They have, uh, no, um, with the governor, uh, they don't have any of his stuff in there. They have Oswald's wedding band uh, in that museum. They have uh, a replica of the rifle that he used, not the original one, because that's in, obviously, uh, archives. But um, they have the suit of the man who was holding Oswald as he was shot. Uh, And it's crazy because they have the photo of that scene uh, that they, they obviously have a video of when Oswald was shot uh, when they were, they were transporting him and the background of where this suit is displayed is the scene and the guy, the officer that was detaining him, his head fits perfectly. Like they have his top hat and they have everything, um, or his fedora. And it's really cool. Like you have to step back and look, but the suit fits exactly in the position he was when the, when that picture was taken. 
uh, as Oswald uh, got shot. It's it's a really amazing uh, museum. I highly recommend if you have anything to do after COVID ends and or if you have some travel time, <laughs> come on down to Dallas and check out the Book Depository Museum. It is breathtaking, uh, especially after you've seen this movie about five or six times uh, pretty close together. It's it's very good. You know what they don't have anymore that was a part of this? Is all it was where he was living at, where Lee Harvey Oswald was living. Right, at. right. They found a tour. I think it was like some apartments or something. Yeah, the, his boarding house. Yeah, like a boarding house. They finally tore those down. So, oh, that's the only thing that's missing. One of those interesting things to me is that they put so much painstaking effort into shooting in the actual locations, and you know whether it be blocking traffic, restoring building floors and doing things and even though they didn't have cgi in their pocket there were easier ways you can build sets you can shoot in other places and there are studio reconstructions that you can make now the stone has a lot of budget so much budget that as devin pointed out you can spend seventy thousand dollars to recreate the oval office which was like on screen for what was it you know eight seconds you said yeah eight seconds yeah so (laughs) i mean uh, when money is not a thing i guess you can do whatever you want to i mean which is why michael bay probably says let's put more explosions in there what we have more money (laughs) put some more explosions in there we still have more money more explosions (laughs) but um but on, on the flip side latoya do you feel like there's like this wonderful like historical value even though this movie is steeped in conspiracy like just to recreate the location and the feel of the time and the place yeah i think that this you know this is actually like this is like the number one of our number one things in history so it's going to hold its value whatever they they had to do to make it look at least somewhat of what it was then yeah i think that that was actually good because you you don't want to have it looking so you don't want to take that away. So it's, I think it was good to do it in the same place because you, it, it actually feels as if it's coming back to life versus doing it, going to Oklahoma and setting up something that looks like it. You're actually here in Dallas and it's, it's more, you got that sentimental value to it and you're actually here. It's here. So yeah, it feels more poignant in a way, you know, most definitely. Definitely. I mean, uh, I, I think it's a testament to, to Oliver Stone, Oliver Wilde, Oliver Stone, uh, about his dedication to making the best movie he can make, especially under the the scrutiny that he was going under for even thought of creating this movie, uh, which he did apparently hold very secretive uh, during the preliminaries of this movie. He was like, he, he kept it very close to the chest. Right. Um, so when it came to shooting, I don't think he really spared any expense. Uh, who was it? Warner Brothers? Uh, I believe he went directly to Warner Brothers and was like, hey, we're going to... He sold the rights to them, and they were like, "Uh, let's go, let's do it. They gave him an insane budget, I'm sure. Yeah, I have no doubt. Now, we talked about about location authenticity being a big part of this movie. Latoya, do you want to talk about, like, the... What people were wearing, the makeup, and, like, the the feeling of the actors themselves and that? Like, did this movie transport you back to the 60s in any special ways that you noticed? Yeah, they they actually had... Remember the lady in red? They had that, it looked just like her. Like everything took you back. Even though we weren't, we weren't born yet, but it actually, you know, you, you have those videotapes and it actually takes you back to what actually occurred, what actually happened, that feeling, that 60s feeling. So you actually feel like you're there in the 60s. It looked at as if it was in the 60s. Uh, you know, they transport you quite well, not only in the style of what Stone's doing, but Obviously, I think there's attention given to the characters as well. So they they did a great job. Uh, you know, from what we all uh, think we know about how the '60s was, <laughs> a lot of the uh, movie magic of what the '60s and and that time frame might have been is like almost like a Pleasantville. You know, everyone's all just happy. Everyone's hair is perfect, and and uh, I think what they did here, and I use this as an example, uh, Kevin Costner and his marriage. You know, they're when they get into these arguments are very proper. Right. Almost, you know, he, they have their little arguments and they're not verbally abusing each other. And, and that it keeps that mentality of the sixties mindset alive, you know, even though it's not picture perfect Pleasantville, like everyone thinks the sixties was just a big 
picture perfect place it wasn't at all by far and and they portray that uh you know obviously with the situation of they're making the movie about the president was assassinated but um no they did a great job i think uh all the vehicles you know all the back all the backing you know all the back shots and everything like that how they did everything it was just perfect yeah this movie certainly reminds you that things weren't perfect uh, to be a woman in this era man to have a house full of kids like that and to do it all on your own it just I was sitting there going like, man, like, uh, that would be tough, you know. <laughs> I mean, like, like, the, oh, for sure. like, I mean, this this is not the only character like this from this time. I mean, that's a typology like of like these these uh, male characters who are so first and secondarily identified by their work and what they do at work and stuff like that. They're so, uh, I won't say totally offhand of their family, but they're not they're not as present. And I am sitting there watching like as like. You know, whether not having modern technology, you don't have Amazon coming to the door and stuff like that. I did sit there and like watching Sissy Spacek's character kind of yelling at him. It was just like, look, I don't care who shot President Kennedy. I need your help. <laughs> and I, I was kind of sitting there uh, just as like a parent today, sitting there going like, yeah, yeah, uh, she needs your help, man. Like that, like that looks like a circus there. You yeah, got to put like, those kids to bed. Put yeah. those kids to bed, man. <laughs> <laughs> your wife's been there all day. Do it. Yeah, absolutely. It's crazy you guys said that because I always imagine the 60s just like this perfect moment. <laughs> leave, leave it a beaver. Was that like the 50s or the 60s? <laughs> yes, it's either the late 50s or early 60s. Um, but uh, something like that, yeah. Right. Everybody's, everybody's grass was edged and cut perfectly and everyone had the cleanest cars and there was never a wrinkle in a suit jacket. The fedora was always nice and textured. And yeah, of course, yeah. I, you know, I did not like Garrison's hat. Like he had, uh, he was a not stylish '60s guy because the '60s is very formal, and you could kind of tell when they were all sitting in that boardroom. Uh, it wasn't Mad Men stylish. Right. Like the the room was a beautiful historical room, and, and New Orleans that they were in. But uh, but on the other hand, this wasn't Don Draper sitting around with all these other high fashion furniture and stuff like that. So I I, I did <laughs> sit there and say like he's not the glamorous '60s. His glasses, his hat. I mean, this was middle class '60s. Yeah, yeah. This was the the, 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 <laughs> the normies. <laughs> yeah, he's he's a little he's a little nerdy. You know, he's not uh, you know he's not the guy they put on the uh, the uh, the cigarette ad of like smoke i'm glamorous agreed but his wife was like super elegant i thought so i i did sit there and i was like that guy's a big nerd we didn't cover the part of the movie where this nerd got like this like you know classy lady like at home like and uh she's she's a strong Had five character. kids with her i know i know <laughs> I, I, I i did i got a little mad at him at times i was like uh soundtrack latoya did you like the music and the sound of this movie the music i think it was the soundtrack was nice I, I felt like it kept things moving well for for the movie. Yeah, it did. It kept the movie. Yeah. It wasn't. It wasn't anything uh, really to comment on. It was all right. You know, it was what you would expect in a movie like this. It was no X Files conspiracy. I'll say that. Like, there's a certain right. tone that the X Files conspiracies give you that you go like, "Ooh, what's up?" Yeah, exactly. I didn't. I didn't have that uh, nefarious feeling off of it, uh, but it, it did keep it the pace moving at least. Oh, for sure. Do you guys want to hand out some awards? Go ahead. All right, Latoya, why don't you start us off? Who's your MVP of JFK? I'm going to give it to Kevin Costner. Kevin Costner. Nice choice. Yeah. Devin, who's your MVP? I'm going to go ahead and say Gary Oldman. Ooh, creep, creepy, creepy Gary Oldman. Yeah, yeah he, he held a very, uh, a very heavy role uh, in this movie. I mean, <laughs> he was like the worst guy on the planet uh, in that you know, in that time. And, uh, I mean, everybody <laughs> hated him. Um, it was, it was bad. And, and I really got to give him the credit. I mean, the guy, the guy put himself in a, in a role where not only was he being portrayed as the worst dude on the planet, he was also part of a movie that everybody was hating on. So I give him all the credit. He was definitely the MVP of that one. Okay. I'm going to pick a different one. I'm going to go with Joe Pesci here. He just stood out to me. Like, he was this larger-than-life character in this movie. It was the eyebrows. He was the eyebrows, <laughs> man. I just, uh, he, he was all over the place, and yeah. His intensity was fantastic. So, uh, I, if nothing else, I'll remember him. And then also Tommy Lee Jones being painted gold. I don't think I can have that removed from my mind. <laughs> <laughs> Best supporting actor, LaToya. I'll go with Joe. I'll go with Joe. Yeah, Joe Pesci. Yeah, I'll go with him. 
any so this is this is a loaded cast with tons of supporting actors what gives what uh makes me happy to hear this but what was your reasoning to beat out all these other amazing supporting actors for for pesci on this one because when when you said that think when you said that um he said that Oliver Stone was kind of rude. So if he if he was able to stand up and continue to do that good of a role, then that's why I'll have to give the thumbs up to him. But you gotta if you're if you're getting abused like that and you are still standing there doing well, good, then yeah, mm, that's a great that, that's a good point. You know, yeah, uh, Devin, best supporting. I'm going to have to give it to Tommy Lee Jones. Uh, Tommy Lee Jones, uh, even though down the line here, we are I'm going to kind of twist it up a little bit. But I'm going to say Tommy Lee Jones definitely earned Best Supporting Actor, uh, in my opinion. I think he did a great job. A uh, lot of uh, hats to wear as this actor or as this character in this movie. Uh, and I think he really nailed it. Was it his dainty little middle finger wave where he only oh, waved Jesus. one finger? <laughs> <laughs> a little bit weird <laughs> he he really he, i think he really stretched himself uh as an actor uh in this film i really do i just i don't know yeah he he, he did a great job he did a great job is really yeah he made a large he also made a large character out of his role as well so it's a great choice for sure i'm going with the mysterious character of x played by donald sutherland in this one there's something mischievous about him like you know he's like you're closer than you think it's like he knows so much and he's divulging all this information in this lengthy aside and there's something i would say the conspiracy feeling of like the excitement of the conspiracy was probably at its peak when he was doing his thing so uh, I, right. he really he stood out he wasn't in the movie throughout the movie but here he, when he when the spotlight was on him he shined brightly so latoya who is your hidden gem? What was Kevin Costner's wife's name? Sissy Spacek is the actress, but uh, that would be Mrs. Garrison, and her name was Liz. Liz Garrison. Yeah, yeah. I would have to say she She probably was. Because, you know, she's married to the guy that is dug up all the commotion, and you get the stress that comes with it, so... She's in the exhaust section of this whole position. <laughs> yeah. She's in the very end of everything. Yeah, she has to hear it all every night. That's a great choice. It is a wonderful choice. Devin, uh, hidden gem. My hidden gem, uh, I'm going to say, is John Candy. <laughs> yeah, great choice. That You know, that southern twang that he pulled off, he, he absolutely he killed the role. I think he did a great job. Uh, and here comes another fun fact. You ready? Yeah. John Candy was almost completely cut from the movie. Oliver Stone was about to cut that whole entire scene with John Candy. And believe it or not, Kevin Costner intervened and fought to keep it. Eventually, Oliver Stone wrote John Candy an apology letter for it, saying that he was sorry for uh, considering cutting John Candy out of the movie. Oh, wow. Wow. Maybe you should write uh, Joe Pesci a sorry letter, too. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that, that's interesting. Uh, and, uh, you know, John Candy also played the character really well. It was like, yeah, I'm guilty as can be. I'm getting out of here kind of like... You know, like exactly. <laughs> yeah, was, he was sweating it. My hidden gem is going to be the real Jim Garrison, who appears in the film as Judge Earl Watson. So... The guy whose case this whole thing was made off of made an appearance right. in this movie. So I thought that was a whole lot of fun. Yeah, that was. Definitely. Uh, I didn't know that uh, until I started digging into this, uh, to the background of this movie. Uh, not just the facts of what was right and wrong, but the actual movie itself, how it was built and who, you know, how it was all put together. I learned that uh, recently. Was, that's pretty awesome. Definitely a good choice. Now, if you had to recast somebody and put somebody else in their place, Latoya, who are you recasting? Oh, that one is a hard one because everybody did such a good. Everybody did a good role. I, I, I wouldn't. There are a lot of good actors in this movie. Tommy Lee Jones. Tommy Lee Jones. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. So who are we gonna get? So, so you're replacing Tommy Lee Jones, which is playing Clay Shaw or Clay Bertrand. Who would you put in his place? A wealthy, slimy businessman, slightly effeminate. Who would who would do that well for you? Who's got a good pinky wave? Yeah. <laughs> Frazier. <laughs> That's him. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> but I would replace him probably with Al Pacino. 
Nice choice. Uh, and I, yeah, big cachet actor. Why not add to the collection of big actors in this movie? All right, and Devin, who are you recasting and who are you putting in their place? I have two. I've said this name a lot during this podcast. Tommy Lee Jones is, is my second choice who I'd replace uh, as well. And I would go with Daniel Day-Lewis uh, in replace of him. But I, I, again, I feel like he's a little bit of a, a headliner. Yeah, I don't know that he's gonna. I don't know that he's gonna take the small role unless he just really likes Oliver Stone. But yeah, when you said you had a second one, uh, the second one I would I would replace Kevin Costner. Wow, Sorry. wow. Uh, and you know who I'd put in his place? Mel Gibson. I hope. Who is it? Dustin Hoffman. Oh, oh okay, yeah, yeah. I would put Dustin Hoffman in that position, and uh, I think he would have. I think he would have done a fantastic job. Yeah, yeah, he'd be channeling his runaway jury. Exactly. Yeah, I I like that. We just recently did The Runaway Jury, so check that episode out. But my recast is going to be Brian Doyle Murray, who plays Jack Ruby. I don't feel like he's... mm, This is not a likable character, and uh, I don't feel like he's the kind of guy who would run a seedy joint uh, like he was in this movie. So I'm going to go with James Gandolfini, who is young and, uh, you know, he's early in his career. So, like, in the true romance era of his career... I'm going with James Gandolfini as Jack Ruby. Wow, that's that's great. Yeah, that's that good. was a really good one. Didn't see that one coming. Yeah, I think honestly, I think a lot of the reason he was chosen for that role was actually he he resembles uh, Jack Ruby a little bit. Well, that's the thing. I think I think Gandolfini's heavy set nature and his thinning hairline, yeah. stuff like that, could kind of pass for Jack Ruby. If you Google the real Jack Ruby, I think if you then look at James Gandolfini, it's not. I mean, it's no worse than Brian Doyle Murray was for the pick. No, oh, yeah, you're right. I, I could see it. Best shot of the movie, LaToya. I think the best shot of the movie is when he was actually coming down Elm Street. I think that was very, very, that, that actually, yeah. that, that one event is what created the movie itself. Mm-hmm. No pun intended. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I didn't think about that. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, no, I... Now, uh, Devin, what was your best shot of the movie? Uh, cinematically, I, I, I was most compelled uh, when Garrison is explaining uh, the whole back into the left uh, theory. Oh, the magic the bullet. case at the end. Yeah. yeah so um, when they're going through that scene and back and to the left, back, and he just keeps repeating it, repeating it, repeating it. It's like it's it's just pounding that ideology in your head like, uh, you know, there's more to this story. Like, there's just no way. And that, I feel like, is, like, the best shot. Uh, maybe not cinematically, like, you know, there's no vast, like, camera angles or anything, but it's just that moment, the heat of the moment where he's in the courtroom and he's pushing his his, you know, his theory on everybody and it's just like it's so it makes you think you're like okay this isn't a movie this is a documentary this is what happened you know what i mean that it's an it's that moment right there it's one of them that that you really got to catch yourself and say wow like this is crazy yeah now there is a, you know if there was ever a magic bullet i believe corn's music video for freak on a leash uh, <laughs> has oh, demonstrated that bullets totally do this and so i mean We've seen it happen now, so it's totally possible. Outrageous. Outrageous. Corn's just proving the laws of physics wrong. Uh, <laughs> and spelling, <laughs> I might add. And spelling, too, I might add. So, uh, Those scientists. Yeah. <laughs> uh, my best shot of the movie is going to be when Kevin Costner and J.O. Sanders' character are looking down the barrel of the gun in the book depository, realizing that this was a very, very difficult shot to take on Kennedy, and this was kind of a light bulb moment for them of saying, like, you'd have to be an excellent marksman, not just even an excellent marksman, like an unrealistically expert, expert marksman of which, you know, Oswald probably is not. This is where at, 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 that's perfect. Uh, this is where you start thinking, okay, you need to look at the actual, the factual versus the fiction uh, in this movie is because were cause they kept, they kept running through all these facts or what they're saying in the movie are facts uh, about the rifle, which was true. Uh, the rifle was a $20 Italian rifle. Uh, they said that the scope was out of alignment. Um, there was a massive elm tree uh, that was blocking, you know, the view. Like, there was all this, right. all these crazy things that going up against Oswald in that moment. And you really got to, you have to do your research. This, this is one of those moments where I started like, you know what? 
I want to see how true this is from the movie to the real, you know, the reality of it. But that is the absolutely a good, a good choice. Yeah. The face shot of the two of them, like looking and having this like epiphany moment of like, oh, we've really stumbled onto something to me. Somehow that just captures the movie there. If I were to take a snapshot of the movie, it's that. So definitely. Latoya, what is your favorite scene from the movie? I, I like when he actually went to New Orleans. I like that scene a lot. The New Orleans whole deal. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like the scene where Kennedy like was actually shot, like the, the feeling of the bar and watching people react to that. Yeah. The court scene was pretty good yeah. too. The court scene was pretty good because he was in the court scene, he was coming up with something and it made you, you know, you wonder. So yeah, the court scene was really good because he, he stood his ground and he didn't, he didn't bag down from, you know, anybody because he was going up against a lot of a lot of people were involved, a lot of big people. So, yeah, the court scene was pretty good. Now, best scene in the movie, Devin. It's probably about 40 minutes into the movie. Kevin Costner is sitting down with his investigating team, and they're talking about, uh, I forget the actress's name. She's going over Oswald's past. Laurie um, Metcalf. Yes, yes, thank you. Uh, she's going over Oswald's past. I keep going back to these cut scenes and and uh, all about Oswald's history in the in the uh, military and how he visited all these different places and recently reached out to these anti Castro uh, Cuban exiles that he was trying to link up with and you know whatever they get into the fight. And as they're going back and talking about this, they're they're cutting away to somebody who is creating the famous picture of Oswald holding the rifle, but they're creating the picture. Right. Yeah. And that was what was on the time magazine cover. And I think it's just really, it was a great scene uh, that they put it together to really push that ideology that this was all a conspiracy. They made it up. And uh, you know, that was kind of the driving factor for this whole movie uh, about how this was, there's something underlying about this. And, and that scene specifically, like they're literally creating this picture that everybody saw um, in these little cut scenes as they're trying to create this bad guy of Oswald. They're, they're also showing how they're setting him up. My best scene is going to be Donald Sutherland's 16 minute monologue uh, where he was, you know, X. So I tipped my hand on that one earlier. Best wardrobe moment, the Toya. I'm going to stick with the lady in red. Good choice. Devin. When. Kevin Costner's on the plane talking with Senator Long, uh, who was played by Walter. I'm going to butcher his name. Mathau. Mathau? Mathau. Mathau, yeah. Uh, they're on the plane flying over D.C., and, and uh, Senator Long is talking, and, you know, they're just they're going back and forth for a minute. But it just their, their attire during the, the flight, uh, it, 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 it brings me back to that 60s ideology. The glam 60s. Everybody was dressed up. Yeah. Everybody was wearing suits and ties. They were in their Sunday best because back in the day, you would dress up like, you know, like you were going to church just to travel. And, and it was uh, and it was just nice to see that it was a testament to that time, that era. And uh, I think it was good. There's also an error in that timeline. Uh, when they're in the plane talking, if you actually watch the scene, uh, you'll see the upper hand luggage shelves. Uh, they have doors on them. Mm. Uh, but at the time, air, aircraft uh, in the 60s actually were just wide open plain shelves. Oh, wow. There was no doors <laughs> securing any luggage or anything like that. But uh, in the scene where they're filming, there's actually doors on the overhead luggage container. Ooh, good catch. My best wardrobe moment is going to go to Tommy Lee Jones. And uh, he just was <laughs> such a physically unusual character like his uh, his his finely pressed tan suits and poofy white hair in a room full of gray and navy suits he just stood out yeah yes he was respected but also he has this um flamboyant character at the same time not like totally over the top but uh and his poofy hair also and the way he like uh, handled his cigarettes in such a way just <laughs> somehow he was channeling his villain uh like role maybe a bond villain maybe a little bit part cruella de vil in there as well so i mean i definitely felt like he wanted to take your puppies yep <laughs> he had that cigarette uh holder for his cigarettes like he would smoke the little tube thing that has the cigarettes at the end of it that was 100 percent Cruella de Vil. Yeah, and like the, the, <laughs> made it look kind of yeah, cool. and like he didn't knock his ashes <laughs> off either. It's just like yeah, yeah, you, you definitely got that from Cruella. So he was classy. He was a classy <laughs> villain. He made smoking look cool. 
Exactly. And that's, uh, yeah, there's the 60s in a nutshell. <laughs> um, uh, change one thing, and only one thing, Latoya. Just the president not getting shot, I guess. Okay, yeah, that, that is an acceptable answer. Uh, JFK not getting shot, uh, yeah. <laughs> that would have been a big change in uh, American history, yeah. too. Yeah, hey, uh, all we need is a time machine to make that happen. <laughs> now, Devin, if you could change one thing. It's a little broad, but I would, I would just like to see more facts. There was a lot of movie magic. I, should, I use the word movie magic because it's, it's Hollywood no matter what at the end of the day. But right. I really wish that they would have, and this is just, I guess this is my conspirator side coming out a little bit. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. I wish all these questionable things that happened uh, during the situation, during the, uh, the court hearings and you know the Warren report and all that, I wish a lot of that was brought into the movie for the factual backing. Mm. Right. Listening to the critics saying, oh, this is just a this is just, you know, it's all it's it's all made up. It's all movie in Hollywood and then nothing. But had they really brought those facts in, there's nothing anybody could have said. And I think that they would have lost they would not have lost the credibility that at whatever magnitude they did, which I'm sure was minuscule at the end of the day. The credibility would not have been lost when they're hitting the watchers and the viewers and the audience with the real facts, but incorporating it into the movie itself. Do you know what I mean? Like, like the scene that you think where uh, your favorite scene where, uh, you know, they're standing in the book depository and they're rattling off all these things about the rifle and Oswald's shooting experience background and all this other stuff. And if all of that was a hundred percent factual, it would have been so much more compelling. Right. Well, there are a lot of people who would like to take you up on that one, judging by the criticisms for this movie. So uh, you're in good company. Mine is going to be more of a storytelling aspect of this. This is a very long movie. And I think that you can remove... I, I'm going to be ambitious and say, I'm going to cut pretty much everything before the garrison experience begins. So there's like a lengthy nine minute long credit intro. There's the lemon scene that we don't need. There's all of this background that... You can put that in a director's cut if you want to, but this movie should probably open up with Garrison running into the bar to see that Kennedy was shot on TV. I want to meet Garrison right away. I think it's very emotionally impactful to see it through his eyes, and I think that's where the movie should have begun. And I'm not kidding. I think you're cutting off 15 to 20 minutes of movie right off the bat. Are you ready for two fun facts? Tell me these facts. Here we go. So we talked about how Stone wanted Marlon Brando in the film. Yeah. He also quoted, on the contrary, it would have been an additional 15 minutes of speech had he played X, <laughs> <laughs> which he could not afford to have in the movie. Fun fact number two, the original cut for JFK was actually four and a half hours long. Oh, wow. No, thank you. No, thank you. <laughs> you've, already pushed my, you've already pushed me too long. I see my, I, was coming, I was coming at this with an ax to, 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 to trim it. So, All right. Uh, Agreed. Now, what's your best quote of the movie? Devin, why don't you take this one first? It's going to be from Joe Pesci. Who did the president? Who killed Kennedy? F, man. It's a mystery. It's a mystery wrapped in a riddle inside an enigma. The F and shooters don't even know. Wow. Yes. And I think that it, <laughs> it truly encompasses wow. the, entire, the entire movie. I love that scene. Pesci, the, the, I gave him my MVP. He earned it in that oh. scene. I love that. Wow. Yeah, I'm, glad, great, I'm really glad you picked that. It, it totally wraps up the entire, I, the whole idea of this, this whole movie and the whole thing with JFK. And it, it, was, it was good. Latoya, are you ready for your best quote? Yeah. Okay. When Kevin Costner, he said, who grieves for Lee Harvey Oswald buried in the tree grave under the name Oswald? Nobody. And that, it, I don't know what right. he said, but that's kind of like how it was. Like, nobody, it's like after this guy did this, nobody wanted to be even associated with him. Poor wife. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And yeah, kids. kids. Yeah. Mine's going to be when Jim Garrison uh, says, let justice be done through the heavens fall. Oh, Yeah. Give this movie a rating on a five-star review, a half-star intervals. Latoya, what would you give this movie? I'll give it a five. Solid five. All right. Now, Devin, how about you? Five-star scale. What are you giving JFK? I'm going to give it a four. Four? Okay. Reason is, uh, again, more factual uh, length. Too long. Uh, But 100% casting was top-notch. 
uh, cinematography top notch, uh, you know, director top notch. I'm actually going to mirror a lot of your comments on that one, Devin. I'm, I'm going to go with a four. Overly ambitious length uh, is, is definitely a big part of this. To your point, uh, it, it, it's, a, it's interesting to make a movie of what could have happened. <laughs> right, right. Any movie that came out on VHS with two cassette tapes, uh, you've done too much. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's a good point. Yeah. Um, uh, now, uh, Devin, do you want to help me pick a movie for next time? I would love to, man. All right. I've got three options here for you. There's a bit of a mixed bag, but these are three options nonetheless. 16 Candles from 1984. A girl's sweet 16th birthday becomes anything but special as she suffers every embarrassment possible. Option two, Out of Sight from 1998. A career bank robber breaks out of jail and shares a moment of mutual attraction with a U.S. marshal he has kidnapped. Option three. Superman 2 from 1980. Superman agrees to sacrifice his power to start the relationship with Lois Lane, unaware that three Kryptonian criminals have invaded. Oof, I cannot turn down some George Clooney. Let's go with Out of Sight. Out of Sight. All right. And Latoya, thank you so much for coming on the show. I hope you had fun. I did. Thank you guys for inviting me. Fantastic. It was great. Thank you so much. And especially with your local on the on-site reporting and expertise that was that was a treat oh thanks remember all the lords ladies and knights of the retro movie roundtable we invite you to reach out to us we want to hear from you so subscribe rate and review on itunes spotify stitcher google play wherever you get your podcasts give us a like on facebook follow us on twitter at at movie underscore retro we're on instagram now email us at retro movie roundtable at yahoo.com and if you want to support the show we have a patreon page as well as always, thank you for listening. Be good to each other and watch more movies. Devin? You know I hate goodbyes. I'll see you later. <laughs>